Beasley. So today, I'm going to be talking to you about dolomites and their formation pathways, how they're formed, and their ability to preserve organic matter within them. I'll start off by defining a few terms about ancient orthogenic concretions. What's orthogenesis? It's a process by which a mineral or a sedimentary rock is generated where it is found. It's made in place. Concretions are hard, they're compact, they're solid, they're isolated structures uh, formed by the precipitation of mineral uh, cement within pore spaces. They fill void spaces within sediments. Orthogenic concretions are a very widespread type of ancient carbonates, of ancient orthogenic carbonates. They can exhibit different types of mineralogy, calcite, siderite, dolomite. Of course, today I'm going to be talking about dolomite. They can form as concretionary layers. Oh no. Oh no, there we go. Uh, so we got a layer here, or as isolated structures. And the isolated structures themselves are what we call concretions. These are from the Monterey Formation. They've been studied for a long time in order to determine formation conditions. And studying them can provide insight into shallow diagenetic environments. We can see what was going on in these sediments that prompted the precipitation of these concretions. Oops, sorry. Um, ancient orthogenic concretions, they're, these carbonate concretions are associated with the degradation of organic compounds. And even though they're associated with degradation or decay, they've actually been found to preserve organic sediment components. Here we have some information from the Holt Shale Okay, uh, on the y-axis we have total inorganic carbon and total organic carbon on the x-axis. So the more inorganic carbon or the more cemented the uh, sediments are, um, the more they can preserve organic matter. And these were taken from samples that were ancient and already exposed in an outcrop. It's thought that they can preserve organic matter by the cementation of these concretions, reducing permeability, which inhibits further degradation of the organic matter. It can protect it from uh, physical degradation, chemical degradation, what have you. Just a list of things that um, have been found within concretionary carbonates. Fossils, uh, sedimentary grains, structures, different organic compounds. So here we have. <laughs> After all that. So sorry. Here we have a uh, concretion that's exposed an outcrop from the Holt Shale on the left. And on the right, uh, there's actually a microfossil that was found within one of these concretions. Orthogenic dolomites, so specifically talking about dolomites now. They're pretty common in the geologic record, including, of course, in the form of concretions. They're formed in alkaline settings due to the degradation of organic matter. As the organic matter degrades, alkalinity is raised, it buffers the environment. Uh, of course, because their uh, calcium carbonates can't be in an acidic environment, otherwise it would dissolve. They're distinguished by expression of non-seawater uh, stable carbon isotopic data. So we see this uh, graph, this figure from the Monterey Formation. The y-axis is uh, oxygen. We're not going to be looking at that. But if you direct your attention to the x-axis, you have a wide range of organic carbon, or sorry, of, or, of carbon isotopic data. Uh, these, these ranges can get even wider than this. This is just some examples of the ranges. 
And the fact that there's such a wide range of these isotopic values, that indicates significant influence by microbial processes. And orthogenic carbonates uh, within still soft marine sediments, so modern sediments, which is what we're going to be looking at in this study, are considered to be modern analogs of ancient concretions. So even though orthogenic dolomites that have been exposed in outcrop have been extensively studied, uh, a study such as this one looking at modern sediments, still soft sediments, sediments that haven't been fully lithified, that has yet to be conducted. So we're hoping to reveal the relationship between organic carbon degradation and orthogenesis and to provide some insight into how this cementation can preserve organic matter once it's been buried. I'm going to be coming back to this figure a lot, so I thought I would introduce it. It shows different uh, pieces of information relative to depth. And this is just relative depth. This isn't uh, an absolute depth. On the left, we have relative con uh, concentrations of dissolved species. Oxygen, sulfate, hydrogen, sulfide, methane, so on. In the middle, we have carbon isotopic data. Marine value starts at around zero, and this shows the isotopic gradient. On the right, we have different microbial processes. And this is all shown relative to their depths. So up near the top, we have oxygen reduction, metal oxide reduction, nitrate reduction. These happen pretty close to the sediment water interface. And these exhibit negative isotopic values. Oxygen reduction uh, it produces acid, so this is unlikely to promote carbonate mineral precipitation as, of course, carbonate minerals need to be precipitated in an alkaline environment. Acid would just dissolve them. Nitrate occurs in too low of an abundance, and that's unlikely to have any effect on orthogenesis. Next up, sulfate reduction. This occurs in shallow sediments, usually a little bit below the previous processes. But these also exhibit negative isotopic values. You can see the sulfate being drawn down and the negative isotopic values that follows. It's thought that sulfate reducing bacteria can help aid in overcoming the kinetic barrier of dolomite formation. Next is the anaerobic oxidation of methane, or AOM. This occurs at the sulfate-methane transition zone. So as you can see, as sulfate's being drawn down and methane begins uh, to be created, um, there's this little transition zone. This is indicated by an inflection of isotopic values, and I'll get to why that is later. But as you can see, it's negative, and then it just kind of turns and starts heading back towards zero. Now, all these processes happen in alkaline environments, but this process specifically also consumes free protons. Next we have methanogenesis that occurs deeper in the sediment column. It increases isotopic value with depth. It may exhibit negative and positive isotopic values. Deeper than methanogenesis is thermal decarboxylation, but as that is over 120 degrees Celsius, it's too hot for microbes in general, so, the, and we're only looking at uh, microbial processes for this study. Also, our sample sites don't get that hot. A list of some of the reactions, the main reactions that happen in these sediments. 
organotrophic sulfate reduction, AOM methanogenesis. These all produce bicarb, which is of course needed for the production of dolomite. And here you see AOM consuming protons. The tie into the isotopic values is that we have just generic organic matter here that's being degraded. And organic matter has about negative 25 per mil isotopic value. Therefore, if the carbon used is depleted, the isotopic signature of the bicarb that is being produced will also be negative. It will be depleted. For AOM, the carbon used for AOM is in the form of methane. And methane is extremely depleted. It can get down to about as low as negative 100 per mil. AOM, the isotopic signature, will be very depleted. Methanogenesis, however, will form methane. This carbon in the methane is, of course, still very light. Therefore, due to the mass balance and the, the fractionation, the carbon that ends up in this bicarb will be very uh, heavy, isotopically heavy. And that's what's going to bring about the positive isotopic values. Sample sites. We got 141 samples from different DSDP or ODP sites, and that is now the IODP, International Ocean Discovery Program. 40 of the samples were authogenic dolomites, and 101 were proximal and distant host samples. A map of where all of the cores are, all four of them, that we took. We have Gulf of California, Peru margin, Cariaco Basin, South Africa margin. These sites were chosen due to their high primary productivity. There's a lot of microbial processes occurring. Dolomites are known to be found here. And of course, these uh, sediments are modern. They're still soft. These orthogenesis rates were calculated using carbon flux, or sorry, calcium flux into the sediments. And that was used to uh, calculate this carbon at orthogenesis rate. The first site, Gulf of California, it lies in between Baja, California, and the city of Guaymas, Mexico. Sediments were rapidly deposited. It was an anoxic environment, hemipelagic, uh, diatomaceous oozes are found here. Uh, deposited uh, beneath an upwelling zone. It dates to late Pliocene, about 4% by weight total organic carbon. And the samples from this core range from about 90 to 430 meters below the seafloor. Another look at the area of the site, and then here is an example of one of the dolomitic stones taken from this core. Down the bottom we see a one uh, centimeter scale. Poor water profile of this area. Looking at sulfate, uh, sulfate in seawater is 28 uh, millimole. So by the time they were able to get data for these sediments, it was already drawn down. So we know sulfate reduction is happening. Ammonia is produced by the degradation of organic matter. So we know things are happening, things are dying, they're being degraded, and they're changing the environment. Magnesium is being drawn down. Again, magnesium goes into the formation of dolomite. So that is strong evidence for, that, for dolomite. Alkalinity. This is a well-buffered environment. Um, alkalinity for seawater is about two millimole. And this begins at almost 50 millimole. And it stays pretty well buffered. The temperature, the thermal gradient, again, this just doesn't get hot enough for thermal decarboxylation to be considered. Next site, Peru margin. So here you have Peru on the left, I'm just going to go over here. Okay, 
So you have Peru on the left, and here we have the salivary basin. Uh, it's rich in diatomaceous oozes, it contains detrital clay, silt, sand. Uh, this site is influenced by subduction tectonics. The shelf is broken up into several forearc basins. It's dated to the Miocene. It's about 1% by weight total organic carbon. And samples range from pretty close to the sediment water interface down to a little bit deeper than 130 meters below the seafloor. Another look at the location of the site. And here is a cross section of the sediments for this site with our site being all the way on the right. Pore water profiles of this area. Again, we see sulfate already being drawn down by the time the samples were taken. Sulfate reduction is occurring, methane is being produced. These uh, trends look a little funny because of the nature of this site. Um, it's receiving an influx of seawater from beneath, so it's kind of making the trends go back backwards, kind of. But sulfate reduction is happening, methane production is happening, magnesium is being consumed. It's an alkaline environment, of course, it's well buffered. And again, the temperature is just not hot enough for thermal decarboxylation to be considered. Third site, Cariaco Basin. It's in between Venezuela and the island of Tortuga. So here we have the site right there. It's hemipelagic. It contains silty clays. It's a quaternary pull apart basin. It's about 4% by weight, total organic carbon. Samples range from about 7 to 135 meters below seafloor. Another look at the location of the site. This site was interesting because it would actually, it wasn't fully anoxic. It would actually switch between periods of oxic and anoxic deposition. But the poor water profiles, uh, again, um, sulfate, it starts off much lower than seawater. Methane is being produced. Magnesium is being drawn down. And this is a well buffered environment. Unfortunately, the thermal gradient information was not available for this site, but we can pretty much assume that it's not hot enough to consider thermal decarboxylation. The last site, the South Africa margin, is off the coast of Namibia in the Walvis Basin. It contains pretty dark clays. The dates for this core span to the Miocene, Upper Miocene to Holocene, it contains many different types of fossils, about 6% by weight, total organic carbon, and samples range from about 137 to about 312 meters below seafloor. Another look at the location of the site, and here is a picture taken from one of the cores from the site. Here we have the uh, dolomite in the lighter sediment here and the, the host sediment. And this is on a cent five centimeter scale. Pore water profiles of the South Africa margin. Sulfate is being reduced. Methane is being produced. Magnesium is being drawn down, going to the formation of dolomite. And this is a well buffered environment and not too hot. So the sca sampling schematic. Previous studies, like the one done on the Holt Shale, took samples from dolomites and host samples that were already exposed in outcrops. So this is open to the atmosphere, which subjects it to weathering. Our samples from the modern cores were taken, they're still modern, they're, they're still soft, they haven't been lithified, and these have, of course, not been exposed to the environment. So a comparison was done. And again, just to reiterate, for previous studies, the more cemented uh, sediments were, the more inorganic carbon sediments had 
the more they were able to preserve organic carbon. The research goals uh, were to identify potential diagenetic pathways of the formation of dolomite and to determine organic carbon preservation compared to the surrounding host sediments. Original hypotheses. We thought that these orthogenic dolomites were formed mostly via methanogenesis and that the dolomites would preserve organic matter compared to the host sediments. Again, these were original hypotheses. Analysis included weight percent of total inorganic carbon, weight percent total organic carbon, and the relative isotopic analysis. For the total inorganic carbon, we took triple kits of 10 milligrams of sample. We sealed them in exotainer vials. The atmosphere was evacuated because we don't want to read the CO2 of the atmosphere. Uh, three milliliters of 10% phosphoric acid was added. It was allowed to react overnight. That was then put into uh, an automate to be analyzed via cavity ring down spectroscopy. So here's that machine right there. The isotopic data was determined simultaneously and corrected through standard calibration. It was reported relative to the Vienna PD Bell Knight standard, VPDB standard. For the total organic carbon, a gram of sample was acidified in 10 milliliters of 3 molar hydrochloric acid and allowed to react overnight. This removes inorganic carbon phases. So from now on, when I say total organic carbon or TOC, you're going to see a subscript saying insol. That means that it's, we're only looking at the insoluble remnants because this acidification removes inorganic carbon phases. It was filtered through a vacuum flask. That was allowed to dry overnight. And then three 10 milligram splits were taken, placed into tin capsules. They were loaded into the combustion module. And uh, that generates the CO2, which is analyzed via the CRDS. And again, just like with the inorganic carbon, this isotopic data was determined simultaneously and also reported relative to VPDB. Results. Gulf of California. Inorganic carbon isotopic data ranged from about 4 per mil all the way up to almost 14 per mil. And these were all positive values. We'll get to that what that means later for the dolomites. It trends positive and they're already all positive. For the uh, organic carbon isotopic data, there's no real trend with depth. However, these are within the normal ranges for uh, marine and terrigenous sources. We have the marines sourced up here. Terrigenous is a little bit more negative. Total organic carbon by depth. Uh, if you notice, the dolomite and host samples are pretty much the same. They're right on top of each other. And the trend for both is that they decrease with depth. For inorganic carbon, no clear trend with depth, neither for dolomites nor for host samples. If we compare total organic carbon to total inorganic carbon, there's no clear trend with depth. And there's still no, no trend with comparing inorganic carbon isotopic data and total inorganic carbon. Actually, on this one, there's, there is kind of a trend. For the Peru margin, inorganic carbon data Isotopic data compared to depth, generally, there's, this, there's still a general trend here that it increases with depth. And these are negative values. It starts off at about negative 11 per mil, and it goes for the dolomites as high as about negative 3 per mil. For the organic carbon isotopic data, these are within the normal range. 
of marine and terrigenous sources. It doesn't necessarily decrease with depth, but it does seem to get more varied with depth. Total organic carbon versus depth. For both dolomite and host samples, the values are pretty much the same and they both decrease with depth. Comparing inorganic carbon to depth, there's no clear trend for neither dolomites nor host samples. Total organic carbon to compared to total inorganic carbon, no clear trend neither for dolomites nor for hosts. Comparing the inorganic carbon isotopic data to inorganic carbon weight percent, not a clear trend. Kind of, maybe kind of a negative trend, but not, nothing significant. Karyako Basin inorganic carbon isotopic data increases with depth. As it goes as low as about negative 14 per mil, all the way up to almost zero, about negative one per mil for both dolomites and host samples. For organic carbon isotopic data, no clear trend with depth, but these are within normal ranges for terrigenous and marine uh, sourced sediments. Total organic carbon versus depth. Now again, this site was interesting because uh, it would switch between periods of oxia and anoxia. Uh, if I had to hazard a guess, I would say this might have been deposited under oxic conditions because there's less carbon and this might have been anoxic. No clear trend though. For total inorganic carbon and depth, no clear trend, neither for dolomites nor for host samples. Total organic carbon versus total inorganic carbon, no clear trend for neither dolomites nor host sediments. Comparing inorganic carbon isotopic data to total inorganic carbon weight percent, there's no clear trend. Last site, South Africa margin. Inorganic isotopic data versus depth. There's a couple outliers, but there is a general increase with depth. And this one actually spans from negative values into positive values. It starts off at about negative two per mil, goes all the way up to about positive seven per mil. For the organic carbon isotopic data, this actually this had the smallest range. You know, the air bars look pretty big, but the range here is just really small. And this fits perfectly in with um, marine sourced sediments. Total organic carbon versus depth decreases from about five weight percent to about four weight percent for dolomites. And comparing inorganic carbon to depth, there's no clear trend for neither dolomites nor for the host samples. Comparing inorganic carbon to organic carbon there's no clear trends for neither dolomites nor for the host samples. Comparing the inorganic carbon isotopic data to inorganic carbon, no clear trend for dolomites nor for host samples. If we look at all four of the cores together, we can see that the carbon isotopic data trend is occurring for all four sites together as well as individually they increase with depth. It spans from negative to positive. Looking at all four sites together for organic carbon isotopic data, there's no trend with depth, but these, again, still fall within normal ranges for terrigenous and marine sediments. Looking at all four sites together for the total organic carbon amount, there's a 
increase, or sorry, decrease with depth. Shallower sediments tend to have more organic carbon and that is lowered as the cores get deeper. And that's true for both dolomites and for hosts. These graphs look pretty similar. If we look at total organic carbon versus total inorganic carbon for all the sites, for dolomites and for host samples, a trend doesn't form when looking at all four together. It's still all over the place. There's no clear trend for the dolomites or for the hosts. Looking at inorganic carbon versus depth for all four sites. There wasn't a trend for individual sites. However, if we look at all four sites together, the deeper cores did tend to have more inorganic carbon overall compared to the shallower cores. And there's a few outliers, but the general trend, there does tend to be more inorganic carbon, more uh, cementation. And looking at the inorganic carbon isotopic data versus TIC, if you look at all four sites together, maybe kind of a positive trend, uh, a loose trend. We'll get to what that means. For inorganic carbon isotopes, for all four of our sites, we have negative values and we have positive values. Now this is evidence for sulfate reduction, AOM, and methanogenesis. We have a nice range follows this trend. So again, the negative values can be sulfate reduction, AOM, or methanogenesis. The positive values have to be methanogenesis. And again, we see the increase with depth. The host sediments don't really have a wide range. Again, of course, they're host sediments. They haven't been altered. So they lie very close to the marine value of zero per mil. Organic carbon isotopes. Again, there's no clear correlation between the isotopic data and depth. So this could mean that the degradation of carbon isn't accompanied by a significant isotopic fractionation, and that the organic matter retains its primary values during burial. And again, these ranges are normal for marine and terrigenous source sediments. Total inorganic carbon. So no apparent correlation between inorganic carbon and depth, but the deeper cores were tend, they, they did tend to contain more inorganic carbon compared to the shallower cores. And there was no apparent correlation between inorganic carbon and organic carbon. This would suggest that the amount of cementation doesn't necessarily preserve the organic carbon. So total organic carbon, sorry, yeah, sorry, total organic carbon with depth, uh, they decrease for all four sites and looking at individual sites. Dolomites and host samples were found to have about the same values. And so again, this shows that these dolomites don't prefer preferentially preserve organic matter like we thought they might. And uh, this may also indicate that these orthogenic carbonates don't preferentially nucle nucleate in regions that are high in organic matter. And there's generally no correlation between the amount of organic carbon and the isotopic data. So that would, that can show that, uh, it may hint that the mechanism under which the dolomite precipitates, whether it be sulfate reduction, AOM, or methanogenesis, that doesn't matter. It doesn't affect the amount of TOC preserved. So conclusions to touch back on those original hypotheses. 
the nature of the orthogenesis of the, uh, these, how these dolomitic, uh, orthogenic dolomites were formed. We have variable pathways because we had such a wide range of isotopic values. There's evidence for microbial respiration, for AOM, and for methanogenesis. And because it increases with depth, this can also mean progressive growth. The organic carbon preservation potential. So the dolomites didn't really have more organic matter within them compared to the host sediments. So there was no preferential preservation. Some possibilities for future studies. So isotopic analysis on individual dolomite crystals could be performed. Because coring in these modern sediments is pretty much done blind, you never know if you're getting a full concretion or part of the concretion. Uh, so doing some kind of radial isotopic or spatial isotopic uh, analysis would prove to be difficult also because dolomites don't necessarily precipitate radially. But you can look at the individual crystals and see if there's progressive growth within these crystals depending on what their isotopic value would look like. If you have something close to zero, it can dip negative, it can dip positive, or go positive. It can be done on individual crystals. Uh, the comparison of inorganic carbon and organic carbon with concretions and host sediments could be done on ancient sediments that have not been exposed in outcrop. So drilling further inland from where they're exposed. This may help to fill in the gap as to when these concretions can start preserving organic matter. We know that they preserve them when they're exposed in outcrop. We can see that there's no prefer preferential preservation within these modern cores, but what's happening to ancient sediments that have not been exposed to outcrop. And these uh, terrestrial cores may provide um, to access to samples that are more directly comparable to modern marine sediments. And the possibility of maybe seeing which type of these uh, mineralogies can preserve organic matter the best. We just looked at dolomites, but what about calcite? What about siderite? What can preserve organic matter the best? Thank you all so much. <laughs>